Hello, I'm Dr. George Cressman, and I'm the historian at the Camp Landing Museum. Today I'd like to chat with you a little bit about the construction that occurred at Camp Landing in the 1940s as the post was mobilized for federal service. The construction project the, uh, for Camp Landing resulted in a series of contracts that were awarded to a company named Sterrett Brothers and Aiken. Sterrett Brothers and Aiken is a New York City firm, and they're most known for their uh, project to build the Empire State Building. So they came down to Camp Landing to build the construction facility, or to build their federal facilities for the, pro uh, the camp during World War II. It's the end of the Depression era. Jobs are very difficult to find, and all of a sudden there's an announcement of a major contract at Camp Landing, and workers began to flood into the area. So all of a sudden, there's lots of work to be had, and construction workers come into the area, trying to live in the small towns of Middleburg and Stark, and there's not much housing there. When construction started, Stark had a population of just under 3,000 people. And they had a water and sewer system designed for 15,000 residents. Lots of growth room for the city itself, the town itself. But overnight, as construction started at Camp Landing, there were 25,000 people trying to live in Stark itself, sleeping in all sorts of places. There was hot bunking going on, trailers, back seats of automobiles. Homeowners moved families to a single room in their house and rented out the rest of the house. Money is beginning to flow in the start, but living is somewhat difficult. The construction work began very quickly. Note the toolboxes. If you showed up at Camp Landing in the morning, with a toolbox that had a hammer and a saw in it, you were immediately classified as a carpenter. Whether you'd ever done any carpentry work at all was not relevant. Construction was a 24 hour a day job and it ran seven days a week. There was no time off. When Starrett Brothers and Eakin came onto the site, the construction site was dominated by oak trees, by pine trees, and interestingly, much of the area was swampy. So all of that swamp area had to be cleared, the oak trees cut, the pine trees uh, cut, and then the low areas all had to be filled. The challenge though, that much of this uh, uh, area had to be cleared in a very short time. Roughly 50 miles of railroad were built using a stock of lighter gauge uh, rail. And they went to the lighter gauge rail because it was immediately available. The next effort involved building a set of roads on the post itself. 125 miles of road were built in under two weeks. And you see the railroads already in use. So the lime rock is being brought into the post on this newly installed road. The next uh, necessary utility item were water mains and sewer lines. The post was, and still is, served by six deep water wells. A wastewater treatment facility was also necessary. That wastewater facility, portions of it, are still in service today in Camp Landing. And of course, when you have a large construction uh, and training area, you have waste to dispose of. So there were a series of incinerators installed on the post. Warehouses were absolutely necessary. You had to store food, equipment, clothing, all of the materials necessary to run a large training facility. Note the railroad coming into the warehouse area itself. Notice that rail lines are laid so they will pass into the warehouse area and a, uh, access to all of the warehouse facilities is available then from the railroad itself. Garages were absolutely necessary. 
The training effort included um, transporting men from, from many, uh, uh, to many places across the post itself. So there were many, many vehicles on the post. Uh, cars, trucks, ambulances, all sorts of vehicles on the post itself. Hiring sufficient carpenters was a terrific problem. So what Starrett Brothers and Eakin did was employ two specific techniques. First, they had men who had less carpentry skills or maybe no carpentry skill work alongside of experienced carpenters to gain some experience. Second, in the sawmill, there was a series of jigs that was set up. They lay down the equivalent of a sheet of plywood and then push two by fours or two by sixes into the corners and nail them down. You'd have now a wall panel or a ceiling panel or a roof panel where they would be erected and put into a uh, mess hall or a chapel, uh, whatever building was going in at that point. First, it allowed fairly rapid construction with people who had less carpentry skills. And two, it facilitated rapid erection of building once the panels were in place. Mess halls could actually be erected in 30 minutes using the panels supplied from the sawmill. The construction of building one building was so rapid that a workman was actually trapped in the attic area of the building. And they had to cut a port into the ceiling to get the man out. What you see is the containment area itself beginning to take shape. Notice that there are now a number of buildings in place, and these are um, becoming uh, an integral part of the containment area itself. Camp Landing had a very large station hospital. Eventually it grew to a 2,700 bed hospital. The buildings were separated, but joined by a covered walkway. The lake is just to the left in this photograph, and there is a uh, uh, station hospital headquarters right in the center. There's sort of a white building area right there in the center. That's where post headquarters is today. The Camp Landing Station Hospital was a full service, fully accredited hospital. Interestingly, Station Hospital delivered babies for many, many of the families that were uh, uh, here with their soldiers. The Red Cross Ambulance Corps from Gainesville that was nicknamed the Stork Club. They were bringing so many women over to Camp Landing for, to deliver their babies. Camp Landing had 24 chapels. And actually when it was converted, uh, when a portion of the post was converted to house a prisoner of war compound. There was one more chapel built, so there were a total of 25 chapels. The chapels were all built to accommodate multiple religious services. And the altar area was on a pedestal that could be rotated. So it could be set up for a Protestant service or rotated to an altar area appropriate for a Roman Catholic service or rotated yet again to serve a Jewish chapel. Camp Landing had 35 PXs, post exchange buildings. You see the interior of one of those PXs. Notice that there are a set of radiators there. There was steam heat available in the, uh, in the station hospital area, but notice the radiators, there are no guards over the radiators. We'd never get away with that today. In this photograph, there's a, you see an aerial uh, view of the containment area, the Camp Landing containment area, in the spring of 1941. At this point, most of the construction is done. There are quarters, well, sort of quarters, but they are hutments. They're not barracks, they're hutments. And that's where the majority of the men training here were quartered. The warehouse areas are in place. And at this point, 
The post has a training capacity of 60,000. It was designed to, to, for two, two infantry divisions and an independent infantry regiment. Here's another aerial view, two years later. This is a 1943 view, aerial view of the containment area. Lake Kingsley is to the left in this photograph. The Federal Parade Ground is in center lower part of this photograph. Station Hospital in the upper left of the photograph. At this point in the lower right, you can see the warehouse area itself. That black area just to the uh, bottom of the warehouse area is a coal pile. The initial facilities uh, and the initial estimate for the facilities at Camp Landing were for one, the training of one infantry division. But within a week of that first contract for Camp Landing construction, the mission had changed to the simultaneous training of two infantry divisions. And then it grew one more time to two infantry divisions plus an independent infantry regiment moving from a training capacity of 39,000 to a training capacity of 60,000. The initial estimate of cost should have been $12.5 million, but the Quartermaster Corps had let a contract for $8 million. For 60,000 trainees, Camp Landing cost should have been 19, just over $19 million. That estimate did not include chapels or the growth in the station hospital. Ultimately, cost reached almost $50 million for the federal facilities at Camp Landing. But this included cost for conversion of the post from a infantry training post to an infantry replacement training center. That change occurred in mid-1943. Their conclusion was that the Army had actually gotten quite a bargain for the construction at, at Camp Landing. Well, thank you very much for spending this time with me today. We most appreciate your, uh, your spending time to listen to this story about Camp Landing construction. We strongly encourage you to come visit us at the Camp Landing Museum. We're open every day from noon to four. We have lots of stories to tell and we'd welcome the opportunity to spend time with you telling more of those stories. Thanks again.